Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second program in the Mirrorwood Center's Presidential Legacy Series. Last month, we hosted Life Lessons in Lincoln, and today we're presenting LBJ's Trials and Triumphs. I am very happy to introduce two women who helped bring the LBJ Presidential Library to life. One is a longtime employee and the other is a volunteer. First, please welcome Laura Egger, a former archive specialist and the current visitor services coordinator at the library. She's a graduate of the University of Michigan in Flint, and Laura has been working at the LBJ Library in Austin, Texas for more than 20 years. In addition, please say hello to Sandy Schwartz, a retired high school teacher, volunteer, and tour docent for the library. In addition to teaching government and history, Sandy has helped develop voter education programs, worked in political campaigns, and also served as a lobbyist on behalf of public school teachers. An alum of the University of Texas at Austin, Sandy proudly proclaimed the LBJ Presidential Library for a happy place. So just as a reminder, please make sure everything is muted. And there will be time at the end, five or 10 minutes for questions. So just save your questions for the end. So now I'm going to turn the program over to Sandy and Laura and let them get started. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're so happy to be here today. Sandy is going to take the lead on the tour, and I am going to be keeping an eye in the chat to answer any questions you have. Um, and then we are happy to answer questions when we're done as well. So take it away, Sandy. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. And I'm even more excited because I just saw in the chat a friend uh, that we grew up together, Fran Reamer. Hi there. Anyway, um, this is a picture of our presidential library. And I want you to keep in mind, you see the gray part? You keep that in mind. We're going to talk specifically about that because it looks like a little daunting in the sense of trying to get through that entire building. So remember the gray part, we're gonna come back to it. Lyndon Johnson was tireless, ambitious, demanding, compassionate, etc. But this talks about his legacy. And what I wanted you to see in particular were the last two sentences in that he did so much, his accomplishments are so much a part of our life that in some ways we take him for granted because everything we do has something to do, not everything, you can never say everything, but most things we do have something to do with the piece of legislation that Johnson passed. For, for example, when you fasten your seatbelts, that was under Johnson. These pens that you see, there are 225 pens in there, in the case, and they represent 225 pieces of legislation that were passed under Johnson. So he used those pens to sign it, but that's not enough. There were 400 significant pieces of legislation that passed under LBJ. Now, when I say significant, I'm talking about civil rights, voting rights, NPR, PBS, uh, gun control, immigration. And we're gonna talk about that later in detail, but there's no other precedent that comes close with the exception of Roosevelt. And he had about the same number and he was in office for 12 years and Johnson was in office for five years. Um, some people called him a tornado. <laughs> I mean, he just didn't stop. Okay, this is the part I was telling you we were gonna talk about the gray part of the museum that you saw on the outside. These are the archives. There are 45 million pages in the archives and they go from the fifth floor to the ninth floor. So that takes up a lot of space and that is, you don't enter the archives. Even a person doing research doesn't enter the archives. Somebody goes in and gets the material and brings it out to them. 
But what's in there is pieces of legislation as well as diaries. And I looked up what was happening since this is July 14th. I looked up what was happening in, in LBJ's diary, which you can go to online, July 14th in 1965. And I don't know whether it was just coincident or fate or whatever, we're meeting on July 14th and the older American Act passed then. And the Older American Act takes care of people like you and me, including an ombudsman, if you or your family ever have problems. Uh, there's an ombudsman um, in your region that helps you to navigate the whole system. Very special, I think. It's very dramatic. And one other reason uh, we're really proud of this, oops, sorry, Laura, is that uh, Lady Bird designed it and it's actually in the library. Many uh, archives are outside of the library. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, this is also unique to our library. I don't think there's any other libraries where you can pick up a phone and hear a phone call of LBJ to anyone from his wife, to uh, legislators, to newspaper men and women, um, J. Edgar Hoover, Martin Luther King, etc. These were released 50 years earlier. They, Johnson wanted them released <laughs> 50 years after his death. And Lady Bird said, no, we're gonna release them early because they found them and they were so valuable. And LBJ was on the phone all the time. You know, I don't know if you've heard that he had a phone in the bathroom, it's true. He was on the phone all the time. He conducted business on the phone constantly. So now we're gonna show you uh, a script from one of the phone calls. And Laura's going to play just a, a few seconds of it. Dick? Yes? I hate to bother you again, but uh, I want you to know that I made that announcement. Okay. So Back. that's what they stand Probably. like. Dick. And it, it also has a um, again, script. But... And what I wanted to show you, and the reason I chose this one, is you cannot say no to LBJ. If you go through it, you're gonna see paragraphs and then you're gonna see parts where LBJ just cuts them off. And I count five times where LBJ asked him to serve as a member of the Warren Commission and he refused. And LBJ just didn't let him off the hook until he, well, he never said he would. The ultimate part was don't tell me what you can do and what you can't, because I can't arrest you and I'm not going to put the FBI on you, but you're goddamn sure going to serve. I'll tell you that. And then he hangs the phone up and he serves on the Warren Commission. His excuse, by the way, his primary excuse was he didn't like our Warren. And LBJ said, well, tough. So that's an interesting call because it tells you how he did his business just wouldn't let a person off the hook. And by the way, he knew things about Richard Russell that he, and Russell kind of knew that. So he knew things about everybody. He never forgot. Okay, now we're gonna go through a timeline a little bit. He was born in uh, 1908. And he died in 1973 at the age of 64, which is, I, I bet most of you didn't think he died that young, but he was 64 when he died. And he died at the ranch of a heart attack. Fortunately, the library was dedicated in 1971, so he did get to see his library. Hmm. This is a picture of LBJ, who was principal and teacher of a poor school district, poverty school district in Catula, Texas, it's still poor. You can see by the sign, it's 1928, and that means he's 20 years old. And I'm, this, I'm showing you this because what he learned in that year 
became the basis for his education program. He learned that these kids were hungry when they came to school, federal funds for food programs. He learned that maybe if they had a head start in education, they would do better when they were in the same classroom with others, head start. So a lot of his education program was formed because of these kids. 20 years old, and you think about that, I'm and, and it leads to something really great in the future. Uh, LBJ uh, graduated from, uh, it's now called Texas State. And I believe then it was Southwest Texas State College in San Marcos. And um, he, he worked in between and that was the in-between job at Catula, Texas. And then he came back and graduated while he was in Texas State, he had to work to get through school. And he hitched himself to the president and he was committed to get a job with the president of the university. And he worked himself up to the point that he did, which tells you at that age, he, he was set on learning and having mentors that would lead him someplace. So he graduated in 1930, and then in 1931, he went to work for a congressman, and that congressman, he was on his staff, was Congressman Kleberg. What's interesting is um, they have a little Congress. It's a, it's a network of staff members, and Johnson became the president of Little Congress. And, this is the start of his networking with members of Congress. He, he did not forget a face. He did not forget a name. So it started when he was a staff member. Uh, this is his ascendancy uh, from the time he was a congressional aide until the time he became a congressman and all the way up to vice president and then president after that. Uh, there's a blank in there. Uh, let's see, 1935, and in 1935, he was director of the National Youth Administration for Texas. Didn't drop out. He always positioned himself on a political career. <clears throat> and this is about the space program. When he was a senator, he was a powerful force behind the creation of the space program, behind the creation of NASA. And that's why NASA was renamed uh, the LBJ Space Center. Um, I would argue here that it began under Johnson. And if it weren't for him being the architect of the space program, we would not be seeing, oh, and he worked with Webb. Webb is the, um, Behind this is the Webb um, telescope. You know, we had yeah. Hubble and we have Webb. So the fact that he worked with Webb for a number of years gives us the pictures that we can now see. The, I, I said he was a part of our life. I mean, and we just take it for granted. This is a great example. Okay, this is after the assassination. He's being sworn in on an airplane. Uh, by the first federal judge uh, who was appointed in Texas, Judge Sarah Hughes. And um, what's interesting about this picture, and I didn't know it until I became a docent, is that LBJ wasn't the one necessarily that was rushing it in, in the sense of being sworn in on an airplane. Jacqueline Kennedy was... Um, was the person who said, we need a president. We cannot wait until we land to have him sworn in. So mm -hmm. she is in her bloodstained suit standing next to the president and Lady Bird next to him while he's being sworn in as president. Um, Fran got married here. 
Oh no, she got married in Agudas Ockham in San Antonio. This is Congregation Agudas Ockham in uh, Austin. The trip that Kennedy was assassinated on was a fundraising trip. They began in Fort Worth. They were in Dallas when he was assassinated and they were coming to Austin. And obviously they never made it to Austin. And when he was in Austin on that day that Kennedy was assassinated, November 22nd, Johnson was going to dedicate a good Sachem here in Austin, Texas. Didn't happen. Uh, and uh, it was postponed, but this was actually the day that it was dedicated. Laura, did you tell me that Webb was in this picture? No, okay, he isn't. Okay, thank you. This, by the way, is on the walls of the congregation as well. So um, he became president and it's not doing what's right that's hard, but it's knowing what is right. And he knew what was right. He was the right man at the right time. And he had in his mind what he wanted to do. Not only the Kennedy vision, but the expansion of the vision into the great society, uh, the war on poverty and um, civil rights. It, which is why in an unprecedented amount of time, he was able to pass major, major legislation. In 64, he passed the civil rights legislation. And I'm saying he passed, obviously Congress passed it, he signed it, but he was the spur that enabled it. And in 1965, just listen to this, voting rights, elementary and secondary education, higher education, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Economic Opportunity Act, Voting Rights Act, Highway Beautification Act, Immigration and Nationality Act. A few, but it's mind boggling when you think of what's happening today. This is a film that uh, we are going to show you and it is about civil rights and voting rights. It spans a time period. And there is one thing I want you to in particular to take notice of uh, when they are crossing the bridge in Selma, Alabama, MLK has his arms linked with someone and look, the someone is Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and he's got a beard and he has a yarmulke and you can tell uh, who he is. Look, it goes by fast. And uh, this rabbi uh, taught future rabbis at the seminaries in, for both the conservative and the reform congregations. And he's got such a neat quote. He said, when I marched in Selma, my feet were praying. So this is a great film. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? I would ask my mother, my father, my segregation. They would say, that's the way it is. Or fester like a sore and then run. You either have to stand up or get knocked down. Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? We must make a pledge that we shall always march ahead. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. Or does it explode? Lyndon Johnson had always believed that civil rights were a moral and constitutional necessity. However, when it came to action, timing was everything. No memorial oration or eulogy could more eloquently honor President Kennedy's memory than the earliest possible passage of the Civil Rights Bill for which he fought so long. When tragedy lands Lyndon Johnson in the presidency, he sets civil rights at the top of his agenda. Now, civil rights leaders at first didn't trust him. 
many of them said to me, we couldn't believe that a man with a Southern accent would ever be really on our side. In his heart, Johnson had been on their side for years. And when he taught those Mexican-American kids in Catula, Texas, he saw the poverty in their eyes, he saw what discrimination was doing to them. Johnson's relationship to the Mexican-American community in Texas was a very personal one. And he knew how important it was to give them an opportunity. But in Congress, Johnson's voting record suggested otherwise. He had voted consistently in the past with his fellow segregations from the South until 57. No one had ever succeeded in getting a civil rights bill through the Senate. Johnson sets out to do it in 1957, and he does it. For the first time, his ambition and his compassion to help people coincide, and it becomes an unstoppable force. 1964, armed with the power of the presidency, Johnson urges a new session of Congress to make swift progress on civil rights legislation outlawing segregation in public spaces. The Southerners filibuster, paralyzing the Senate for 83 days. President Johnson declared to Richard Russell, I've got to run over you, Dick. Unlike what happened in the past, there will be no compromise. We're going to take it all. He brings the Republicans to join the Northern Democrats, breaks that filibuster. The historic Civil Rights Act ending segregation in the South is formed. Buoyed by their victory in 64, Civil rights leaders began to demand legislation that would provide equal voting rights for all Americans. On March 7, 1965, we had planned to march from Selma to Montgomery to dramatize to the nation and to the world that people of color wanted to register to vote. The Selma police confront the peaceful demonstrators with tear gas and billy clubs. They call it Bloody Sunday. The White House is flooded with calls and telegrams, condemning the violence and demanding the passage of new voting rights legislation. Johnson understood that there were those moments when you had to act immediately to mobilize that public sentiment and get Congress to act. It is wrong, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. I watched that speech with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that evening. When Linda Johnson said, and we shall overcome, I looked at Dr. King, tears came down his face. And Dr. King said, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery. The Voting Rights Act will be passed. April, 1968, Dr. King goes to Memphis to lead the sanitation workers strike. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. Johnson uses the tragedy of Dr. King's death to hasten the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which bans discrimination in housing. The morning after King's assassination, the president called me and said, we're going to ask them to pass this bill now in honor of this slain civil rights leader. And we got our civil rights bill out of the house. It never would have happened except for that. In March 1967, he signs the Jury Selection and Service Act, banning racial discrimination in federal jury selections. And he diversifies high levels of government appointing the first African-Americans to the Supreme Court, the Cabinet, and the Federal Reserve Board. Four years after leaving the White House, 
Johnson convened a civil rights symposium at the LBJ Library, where he made his last public address. We have proved that great progress is possible. We know how much still remains to be done. Nearly two generations later, four presidents came to the LBJ Library for a civil rights summit to take stock of where we are today and to reflect upon Johnson's role in civil rights. Lyndon Johnson came along with his great uh, insight and political courage and literally changed my personal life and the life of everyone that lived in America. Just as Abraham Lincoln stewarded the 13th Amendment through Congress, Johnson's leadership embodies the power of the presidency to redeem the promise of America. Through these efforts, LBJ earned the highest compliment a democracy can provide. He made us one people. Because of the civil rights movement, because of the laws President Johnson signed, new doors of opportunity and education swung open for everybody. They swung open for you and they swung open for me. And that's why I'm standing here today, because of those efforts, because of that legacy. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then, my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. What happens to a dream? I think it's a very powerful film. Um, I sort of have tears in my eyes every time I see it. Um, you've heard Doris Kearns Goodwin in the film, and you mm -hmm. also heard Clinton say, quote, Abraham Lincoln. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin, a renowned historian, says that there's no one that did more for civil rights than Johnson after Lincoln. So she puts Johnson number second, in, number two. And you also saw him going up the stairs to give his last civil rights message. He was, um, his speech, he, he was uh, really ill at the time and he was advised not to go. Um, but he was so dedicated and devoted to civil rights that he, he went and he died a couple of months thereafter. So I just wanted you to know about that. Um, this is Johnson and he is signing the civil rights legislation July 2nd, 1964. And uh, he, see all the pens used? He gave pens to everyone who helped him. He, he knew how to keep people on his side and how to keep people happy and giving a pen was one of the ways. Um, I've heard, I've never seen it, but I've heard that he gave away so many pens that he would sign, you know, a little dot and then go on and a little dot. And if you saw the signature on this piece of legislation, it was just dots to spell out Lyndon Baines Johnson or Lyndon B. Johnson. So um, he, he knew how to keep his friends and this was one of the ways. This is uh, how he saw beyond the great society uh, in terms of equal opportunity, civil rights and fighting poverty. And, this is the other areas where he was strong in urging legislation, education, healthcare, immigration, the arts, the environment, safety, foreign aid, crime prevention. If, if you ignored them, it wouldn't be a great society. So these are some of the areas in which he fought so hard to have legislation passed that would equal access to the government. Mm -hmm. I had no idea until I became a docent about these statistics either, as far as the percentage of people in poverty when he took office. Um, 
especially over 65. Did you, did you see that? A third of us, the senior population lived in poverty. That's more than the others. And it was because we didn't have Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, these are pictures at the library showing the war on poverty and showing um, how Johnson talked to the people, how he went into Appalachia and other areas so that, um, here we go, <laughs> uh, so that he had an understanding of what life was like in poverty situations. All right, this, is, this comes to you through the wonders of, of Laura Eckert, where she juxtaposed a couple of pieces of the diary. And, and what is interesting to me about this, you notice at the top 645, at the, the top of um, the first page, he's meeting with leadership and he's meeting with leadership about the Vietnam War. So pretty serious situation. And then uh, an hour and 15 minutes later, he gets a call and the call is about um, uh, Cheney, Goodwin, Goodman and Schwerner who were in um, Mississippi, yeah, Mississippi at the time uh, on a voter rights, uh, voter registration campaign. And they knew at that point that there was a problem. And then, you know, 18 minutes later, he goes back to Vietnam and he continues to talk about what's happening in Mississippi throughout the rest of the day. And then the next day, he, he learns about the bodies and the killings, and he talks to the parents. So I, I just can't believe um, what it takes to have all of this on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Wow. This is Lady Bird Johnson on a campaign for 1964 when Lyndon Johnson was running for president with Hubert Humphrey. This is called the Lady Bird Special and she went into the South. I, I didn't say when uh, the civil rights legislation was passed, that Johnson knew he was gonna lose the South. And he said, uh, we might ride off the South for a generation. So it was hard to go into the South mm -hmm. and to talk about civil rights legislation and why it was important to pass the civil rights legislation, but Lady Bird wanted to do it. And uh, this is the first time a first lady campaigned uh, in her own geographical area without uh, the president being part of it. And you can see uh, that's her daughter waving, but it was an all women's campaign. This was about women speaking to people from the South on civil rights. And it, all these people that are gathered were not her supporters necessarily. Uh, I mean, this was, this was tough. They threw things at her, they spit on her. There were demonstrations and she, she continued. And she said, isn't it wonderful? We live in a land of freedom where we have freedom speak of speech, I listen to you, now you listen to me. And she, she tried. I, I think this is also um, where they had a decoy train uh, because it was so dangerous, they actually had to send another train uh, decoying this one. This is uh, LBJ signing pieces of legislation in terms of elementary, higher ed, and this is Lucy walking with a group of Head Start people. And I have a, I have a quote that I wanna read from Darren Walker. 
You might know he's president of the Ford Foundation. He has been in that position since 2013. And he controls at any time between a 16 to $18 billion human welfare and social justice uh, budget. And he is, by the way, a University of Texas graduate and the University of Texas donated the land to the library. So this is the quote, time for glasses. Sometime around my fifth birthday, a clipboard carrying young woman knocked on our door and began a conversation with my mom on our porch. As it turned out, this woman worked for a brand new education program, the leading edge of President Johnson's war on poverty. And she asked my mother if she would enroll me. My mother said, yes, of course. And not long thereafter, I began attending a makeshift preschool at a church not far from our home. It was not until years later that I learned that the idea for this particular program was funded with an investment from the Ford Foundation. The program was called Head Start and it gave me mine. Isn't that amazing how circuitous it was? I mean, he's now the president of the Ford Foundation. He went to Head Start. He was in the first class because of a Ford Foundation grant. And he was one of over a half a million kids in Head Start that got their start because of Head Start. I just, and he is fabulous. Okay, here is the connection between the Truman Library, your library in Independence, and our library, the LBJ Library in Austin. You recognize all those people, Harry and Bess Truman and uh, received the first two Medicare cards. President Truman had tried to pass Medicare legislation and he was unsuccessful. So when President Johnson was able to maneuver it through the House and Senate, he wanted Harry and Bess Truman to get the first two cards. So he went to the Truman Library to give the cards after he signed the legislation to Harry and Bess Truman. While he was at the library, he toured the library. Now the LBJ library was being built while he toured, LBJ toured the Truman library. And the Truman library had an oval office and LBJ came back because it wasn't planned in the architect's plans for our library to have an Oval Office. And so he came back and told the architect, we're gonna have an Oval Office. And the architect said, well, we don't have room. And actually as told by Lucy, they went back and forth for a while. Uh, and finally uh, he said, by golly, although he didn't use those words, those are my words. <laughs> it's my library and we're gonna have an oval office in my library. Now this is seven eighths its size and the um, ceiling is, is a little less, but uh, Johnson always thought that part of his legacy would be compromise. And, and uh, he said, okay, I'm willing to compromise. Something of interest, you can see the picture frame right in front of the chair on top of the desk. By the way, that desk is, he's used, he brought it along from Congress because it, he could sit under it. It was tall enough where he could get his feet under it. But you would think that that was a picture and that was really um, his daily schedule in there. He had his daily schedule on top of the desk. Okay. Um. So this is the desk where he signed the voting rights legislation. And just like the desk where he, he, you have the desk where the Medicare legislation was signed in the Truman Library, by the way. And these are statistics, 1965, less than 7% of blacks registered to vote in Mississippi. And in two years time, almost 60%. 1970, 
So that's that's the difference he made. And there are statistics like that, like that throughout the library, whether it has to do with civil rights, voting rights, the arts, the environment, um, uh, whatever. And, and this talks about how he fostered the National Endowment for the Arts, the humanities, public broadcasting, created uh, everything. You know, he just, he was phenomenal. This uh, is about Lady Bird Johnson and uh, beautification project. And of course, um, it was much more than a beautification project. It was an environmental project. And she hated the word beautification, but that's just the way it was. It couldn't pass under any other name. It was a political, um, it, it, it was a political decision to call it beautification. Um, I think there were 38 national parks that uh, came into being under President Johnson. Lady Bird hooked up with uh, Senator Udall and we know it is getting rid of billboards and as blue bonnets and, uh, but it, it was so much more. And interestingly enough, it started because Lady Bird lived in Washington DC and the parks, um, on the minority side of town were, were blighted. And so she wanted to clean up the parks so that the kids who lived there and the people who lived there would feel safe uh, to go there. So she wanted to make them beautiful and that's how it started. And she also wanted to make them beautiful because when tourists came to Washington DC, they only went through a part of Washington DC. So she wanted to extend what people could see in DC. That is um, LBJ giving the pen to Lady Bird uh, where he signed that legislation. I just, I just love um, the smiles and how they vibrate, um, vi how vibrant they are in that picture. By the way, um, they met on a blind date, an arranged date uh, in the Driscoll Hotel. And by the end of the day, that they spent together, LBJ asked her to marry him. So one day in a whirlwind courtship, they were married like uh, less than a week, wasn't it? A week later, two weeks? It was about two months that they got married. Two months? Oh yeah. yeah. But okay. it was like six weeks of intense letter writing back yeah. and forth every day. Um, because she was down in Texas and he was up in DC. And then in November, they got married. And didn't he find, didn't he say, you better make up your mind right now? Yes, I mean, because he, she he never was... said yes before right. the day they yeah. got married. She kept putting him off and he would ask over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He knew what he had. Okay. All right, take a look. I'm going to give you some time to look at this list because these are some of the pieces of legislation, as I said, that were passed under the five years of the Johnson administration, and some of these you may not know about or what it means. Uh, truth in packaging began uh, our knowing what ingredients. We're in food. In the end, we'll have time for questions and you can also say which, which one of those surprised you. Okay, juxtaposition to the federal programs and the national policies, which most people would consider Johnson up here is Vietnam. And so people recognize him as a great president as far as national policies, not so much as far as Vietnam. Uh, he inherited Vietnam. He didn't start it, but he did increase the amount of troops there. Um, Johnson said, I am not gonna be the first president to withdraw funds and troops from a communist nation. Uh, 
we grew up during that time. We know of the domino theory in the Cold War, um, what a Cold War was. And the domino theory was if one country fell, they would all fall. So Johnson persisted with, and he had that same advice from the people that surrounded him to continue the war and to increase the number of troops that were there. Um, I'm not making any excuses. I mean, the buck stops here. That was a famous quote from President Truman. So it does. He, this is uh, showing him visiting uh, troops in, uh, I, I think this was a VA center. I think this was uh, at home. And I, this picture on the right speaks for itself in terms of how agonizing it was, and he, he often said, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. But what I wanted you to notice was the tape recorder. And these mm -hmm. were tapes that were done by his son-in-law, Rob, who married uh, uh, Linda Bird. And Rob was in Vietnam and would send tapes to his father-in-law or the president to listen to. Um, he didn't know what to do. He just didn't know what to do about Vietnam. This is um, his speech where he announced he was not running for office, nor would he accept the nomination if it was offered to him. Lady Bird, uh, always at his side, um, his soulmate in life and politics is helping him edit the speech. And this is the way um, presidents looked at the speech as they were delivering it. And Laura's pointing out where it starts down and then moves on up. And that's how they had to view it as far as uh, delivering it nationwide. This is a, a newly found letter um, newly found in the archives in um, Lady Bird's diary. Uh, Lady Bird understood legacies and she began a diary the day after uh, the assassination. And she, she um, wrote about everything and she transcribed it. Uh, and this says that you can, it's hard to read, but I'm, it says, take another three or four years, run for election in 1964, but no, not in 68. Uh, you're gonna be 59 by then, Johnson men die early, and I want you to spend some time at the ranch, and I wanna be with you, I want you to be with your daughters and your grandchildren. And so she had her mindset that he would serve one term. And something else about that is that she began working on the library early into his first term of office. So she only conceived of one term. This is Johnson hmm. as a doting uh, grandparent and dog lover. That's, uh, that's his favorite dog. Uh, Lucy found it on the way home in a gas station abandoned. She was on her way home to the ranch uh, for Thanksgiving. This is Johnson and you can actually hear him howling with the dog and you can see his little grandson looking up and saying, what in the world are you doing? Uh, this is Johnson while he was at the White House and his grandson, uh, went to the White House barber to have his first haircut and Johnson was there with him. He was also there uh, in meetings. So, uh, there's the picture I, I saw once of him like almost crawling on the table. <laughs> oh, this, I'm, this shows a little bit about Johnson's uh, sense of humor. Uh, at the ranch, he had an amphibious car and the people didn't know that he was gonna drive from land into water. 
And this shows when he's hitting the water and McNamara is in the car and this is the Secret Service man, man on top. And this is a picture where they're all smiling, but we also have one where there is fear on the face of Eunice Shriver uh, because they actually, they didn't know. He would just push him in the water and then the car would begin to float. Sense of humor. Uh, this is his library being dedicated. You can see Nixon speaking. Oh, the Longhorn Band's in the background. Hook them horns. Anyway, um, this is a good opportunity for me to tell you that um, every president since Roosevelt, with the exception of Truman, had taped conversations, and it ended with Nixon. And Johnson advised Nixon to keep taping the conversations. Didn't end as well for Nixon. And this is his quote. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. That was, by the way, my daughter's lullaby. I sang to her, we shall overcome all the time. I hope you have questions. You're still muted, Laura. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions for Sandy or for Laura about uh, President Johnson or um, Lady Bird. Mm -hmm. So it looks like somebody has a question. Um, I can't see it. I think it's me. Anyway, that was just wonderful. Thank you so much. And I read the book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, Lyndon Johnson, you know, with the and the American Dream. And you hit upon everything. Uh, the one thing, though, that you, you neglected to say, which I'd like to know how you felt about that, was Bobby Kennedy's um, horrible hatred for, for, for Johnson and made it as difficult for him as he possibly could. And then my other opinion is, and I'm just, I hate saying this, is that he achieved so much. But unfortunately, in most people's minds, the things he's remembered for is the Vietnam War. He inherited it, I know. But most people blame him for keeping the war going. And I thought it was interesting, Doris Kearns Goodwin, where she actually said she was so close to him that she actually, nothing went on, slept in the same bedroom with him, which I thought was sort of odd. Uh, so that if he ever had any opinions or any questions, she was always right there. Anyway, the book is great. So I just want, was wondering if you wanted to comment on Kennedy mainly. Um, true. I mean, Robert Kennedy tried to talk Bobby. Bobby Kennedy tried to talk Jack out of naming Johnson as uh, vice president and then wanted Johnson in a very low profile situation. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, Kennedy wouldn't have won the presidency would it not been for Johnson because he needed to carry Texas. And Johnson knew that and understood that. And the one thing I will say is that, uh, another thing I'll say about that is, um, there was a very close relationship between Johnson and Kennedy, and in particular, Lady Bird and Jacqueline and the girls. Um, uh, they were very close. And it, there's Linda, Linda Bird has a letter that was written to her from Johnson. Uh, I'm sorry, from Kennedy. And I can't remember whether it was uh, from Jacqueline or whether it was actually from Jack. But the letter says that you're, you are both so wonderful um, and that I can only hope that our children are raised the same way you are. And there are phone conversations and, and uh, letters uh, that Jacqueline says how gracious he was in terms of um, after the assassination. Uh, she stayed in the White House uh, as long as she wanted to. They did not move into the White House until she was 
Jacqueline was ready for them to. So, um, but the relationship between RFK and JFK, bitter. Mm. LBJ, yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, say it. Sorry, sorry. No, I noticed that in the chat, somebody asked about what LBJ had to say about gun control. He actually passed um, the Gun Control Act in 1968. It, uh, it banned mail order sales of rifles and shotguns. It prohibited felons, um, drug users, and people who were found to be mentally incompetent of buying guns. So he actually was very pro gun control, which actually is pretty surprising since when they did those drives around the ranch um, in the amphibious car, he would have a gun <laughs> in the car in case he wanted to shoot something on his ranch. So, um, but he did think that we had to control guns and whose hands they were in. So um, he was a Texan that was pro gun control. <laughs> I want to make sure Fran has a question and she's had her hand up for a while. So Fran, okay. Go uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, Sandy. We have been to the LBJ library and it wasn't nearly as good without you. I wish we had gone with you. And second, say hi to Lenny. And third, uh, if you look at our background, that's a St. John's Wart. That's a, what's blooming in Missouri right now. And this is a great tribute to Lady Bird Johnson because as soon as she, they were no longer in the White House, she went and started the Lady Bird Johnson a wildflower center, which has influenced native plantings all over the country. So I just had to say that for her because she's our great hero too. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful, when you come and visit the LBJ library, you have to save time for the wildflower center. And it's, right. a, it's, it's beautiful. Say hi to Audrey and I can't believe I'm seeing you. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Marilyn, do you still have another question? Because your hand's still up. Just asking. No, that's okay. The only thing I also read was that Lady Bird was the only one that could give him advice, that he listened to her <clears throat> and always frequently went to her for advice. Absolutely. That was also in the book, too. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think he did ask other people for advice, but hers was always top priority to yes, him. Yes. Um, as you notice that the uh, memo that Sandy shared about the not running again, she wrote in 1964, before the 1964 election and said, you know, in three years and three or four months, you'll announce that you're not running again. I mean, she spelled it all out for him. That whole memo was seven pages long. We just included the last couple of pages. But yeah, I mean, she was right there by his side the whole time. Uh, people say uh, when she was at the White House, he was much happier than mm -hmm. when she was not at the White House. And um, I said, well, I was introduced as... Uh, LBJ Presidential Library being my happy place. And I really looked forward to retirement so that I could become a docent there. And I think retirement is wonderful because we can learn, we can continue to learn and we can spread our wings. But I also uh, wanna thank Laura because she's one of the, you have a Laura that probably makes where you are your happy place. But I have a Laura that makes my happy place. Uh, She's, she's just absolutely fabulous. The best person I have ever worked with in terms of um, my, uh, heading a volunteer system. And uh, I encourage you, I encourage you to listen to the Zoom that is going to be by Mark Adams from the Truman, seen her yet. from the Truman Library. And because uh, the Truman Library has just been redone and it is fabulous. Yeah, that's coming up next month. Yep. And don't miss it. It's it's uh, it's almost as good as ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so very, very much. This has been a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate your time and your energy. You're welcome. And What's the weather like? I'm going to be there on the 24th. <laughs> it's hot. How's the weather? It's hot. Okay. Great. It's good for the summer. It's odd, but you know, we love it. Okay. I was going to say, while we were on this call, I got a breaking news thing that the last seven days have been the hottest week long streak in uh, Austin history. So we understand hot, let me tell you. Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. I so, love. 
I love doing this. Thank you all so much for joining me. Absolutely. Welcome. And Welcome if on. anybody has any further questions, please feel free to reach out. Either Laura can uh, contact us or I had my contact information up there. We would love to have you visit. And thank you again for having thank us. You. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great program. Hey, have a good week.